Thank you, Spencer. Thank you all for coming out on a cold and rainy, windy night. Um, I want to thank Nikolai, Nikolai Worry. Uh, I want to thank uh, Nikolai for being such a great host uh, and the Clinton School uh, for the invitation to, to talk to you tonight um, about the future of America's colleges and, um, and universities. It's hard to imagine a better time to have this, um, this conversation. Well, a better time or a worse time, depending on your, on your, your point of view. Um, it seems like every cable news show that you turn to, every newspaper that you open, uh, has a discussion about, um, uh, about student debt. Um, the, uh, the Penn State scandal has sort of brought up uh, a lot of questions about the role of intercollegiate athletics um, in higher education. Um, we're now in the season of political demagoguery, uh, and uh, higher education hasn't been spared that particular axe. Um, there's even a YouTube conspiracy video, um, uh, the higher education uh, conspiracy that's drawn two million, uh, two million viewers um, on, uh, um, on the YouTube site. Um, and, and all of this is happening in, in uh, an environment where there's incredible ferment outside higher education. Khan Academy, just a fellow in Silicon Valley who decided to, to set up a video camera in his broom closet uh, to record videos to help his cousins get through uh, freshman calculus. Um, India has announced that it's going to open 27,000 new universities over the next 10 years. Uh, and Silicon Valley startups uh, that are able to draw 150,000 uh, students to an introductory um, course on, uh, on programming. Um, we're adding a billion new students to higher education uh, over the next, next 10 years. And it's all occurring in a backdrop of declining public support. So that's how I want to frame um, frame the discussion uh, tonight. And, and what I'd like to do is to draw a sharp distinction for you between um, how academics talk to each other about higher education uh, and how uh, the general public at large um, views um, the nation's colleges and, and universities. So let me tell you how the book got written. Maybe, maybe it'll, it'll help explain how we got to this point. I, I was uh, dean of uh, the College of Computing at Georgia Tech uh, until 2009. Uh, and I stepped down, uh, and took a sabbatical, um, planning to write um, a business book, actually. And when deans step down, they're expected to, to write a valedictory for their, um, for their presidents and, uh, and provosts, explaining what they learned in the job and what, what they're going to pass on to their successors. So I did that. Um, and um, I wrote a five-page memo uh, to my president. And um, I showed it to some colleagues before I sent it to the, to, to the president. And, and uh, uh, I got interesting rea reactions like, um, well, that's a lot of crap. <laughs> I don't believe that. Uh, so I went back and re rewrote my memo. And it became a 10-page memo and a 20-page memo and a 50-page memo. And I stopped at 100 pages. I decided, this is, this is enough. I've done enough explaining. I put it in a drawer uh, and talked to my editor uh, at MIT Press about the book that I really wanted to write. And she happened to mention casually at the end of a conversation, um, what else are you working on? And I said, well, not much. I've got this 100-page memo that really isn't worth much. And she said, oh. Well, the number one thing that we hear about as a book publisher uh, is the future of higher education. I'd be really interested in looking at that. So I showed her the book, and she, uh, she bought the book um, immediately. Uh, and I set out to write a book about the future uh, of higher education. And being a professor, I thought that the book would be written for other, uh, for other professors, just as my memo was going to be written for, for my administrators. I happened to be at a neighborhood cocktail party one night. Uh, and again, in a casual conversation, uh, one of my neighbors said, well, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm writing a book. Oh, what's the book about? And I started explaining what the book was about. And immediately, I could see his eyes glaze over. <laughs> it, it's not that I'm a particularly 
boring person to talk to at a, at a, at a, at a cocktail party, but it just, I wasn't connecting with him. And this is a person who had a doctorate. He had spent his whole career uh, either associating with academics or around universities, and he had no idea what I was talking about. And so my book, by a professor, for a professor, took a right turn. Uh, and I decided to write a book uh, for the rest of the world um, on the theory that academics spend a lot of time talking to each other uh, and relatively little time talking to the, uh, the public. And, and so this is a, this is a book that's, um, that's aimed at the, at the public. So what were people asking me? Um, they were asking me questions like, um, so why does it cost so much? I see tuitions going up every year. Why, um, why is that? Um, why are the outcomes so bad? I just saw the, uh, the Arkansas completion rate uh, data uh, that was published in the Chronicle of Higher Education, uh, and um, uh, it's, it's cause for public discussion. Um, why can't I understand what's going on? Why is it that every time I talk to a professor, I have no idea what's going on in my local public university? Is it worth it? This is a question that you hear a lot. I'm going to go in debt 25, 30, 40, 50, sometimes $100,000 for this college degree. Is it worth it? Um, and why can't universities change? That was the number one question. Why can't um, universities change? And in each of those questions, there's a lot of public discussion that um, offers what I consider to be easy fixes and easy answers to those, um, to those questions. Um, almost none of it informed by facts or data. And in fact, when we have these conversations, you can almost imagine what the bar bet is going gonna, is gonna to look like. I can say, oh, did you know that, and, and I'll quote some fact about the local university, and chances are um, the, um, the public uh, perception of what's going on in the local university is completely at odds with what the, what the facts are. Um, so, for example, there's a great discussion taking place uh, in the media these days about what's causing the rise in tuition. And, and one of the theories is that it's the availability of federal grants. Available, availability of Pell Grants is driving the cost of tuition. It's a theory that's un supported, completely unsupported, by data. Um, in the first place, most Pell Grants go to for-profit institutions, institutions that have an incentive to keep their costs, uh, costs low since they pocket the difference between what students pay and what it costs to, um, uh, to educate a student. Tuition at private universities has not risen dramatically over the last 10 years. Tuition at public universities has at, risen at an annual rate of about 9%. Um, 9%. Interestingly enough, there's been very little increase in spending at those, at those universities. So it's hard to make the argument, you can make the argument that, that, that you know, the availability of funds may be driving tuition increases, but it's not driving costs. And so the question is, why is that? What is, um, what is driving costs? We'll, we'll come back to that point um, in, a, in a few minutes. So what's with the title of this book, Abelard to Apple? Um, Peter Abelard was an 11th century uh, Parisian monk. If anyone knows about Peter Abelard at all, it's because he had a disastrous love affair with a, uh, a young lady named Heloise. Uh, it ended badly um, for both of them. I won't give it away, but if you read the book um, uh, or, uh, or go to Wikipedia, you'll find out Peter Abelard's, um, Abelard's fate. Peter Abelard was arguably the first pure university professor. He was unassociated with the university, interestingly enough, but he was, by all accounts, a charismatic, physically compelling uh, figure who could draw thousands of students uh, to his, uh, his lectures. And his lectures were all about um, uh, philosophical arguments uh, involving um, uh, theology. And it, he, he, was particularly well known for a work called Yes and No, Sic et Non uh, in, in, in Latin, in which he used words of the church hierarchy against them to point out contradictions. And you can imagine that this made 
bishops and popes not not too happy with with Abelard, which had something to do with his problems later later in life. But it was it was a wonderful way to teach argumentation, uh, and he was extremely successful at it. People would come from all over Europe to be taught by Peter Abelard. Apple refers to Apple Computer. In particular, it refers to uh, Apple's um, website, iTunes U, where you can download for free um, lectures from um, the best teachers in the world. Uh, and uh, in some sense, um, this is my metaphor for uh, for university teaching in the 21st, 21st century. So, so the book makes a connection between this historical figure, Peter Abelard, and, and the wonderful teachers who are available on iTunes U, and tracks what happens to institutions of higher learning as they lose their focus on what the real value is, which is teaching students. As soon as they do that, as soon as the institutions become focused on themselves, as soon as they become focused on the minutia of the profession, as soon as they become focused more on things that are not related to education, they lose their way, they lose their public support, and they're replaced by other, um, by other uh, institutions. So the book is really that there is a message in this journey from Peter Avalard to Apple Computer. Now what about the subtitle of the, of the book, The Fate of American Colleges and Universities? So what is the fate? The, the fate is um, uh, embarrassingly simple. The fate is that like every other human endeavor, higher education as an institution is subject to the same forces that every other activity is. It's subject to the same economic, political, geographic disruptive forces. It's an incredibly controversial position to take uh, in academia. Uh, but in order to not take that position, you have to step outside yourself and say, well, there has to be then some magical reason that this particular institution is spared the fate that everything, uh, everything else is. And, and no one can seem to come up with that explanation. Institutions that don't provide value, institutions uh, who are excessively inwardly focused are usually swept to the margins. So that's a proposition that I want you to carry, um, carry with you tonight. And what do I mean by value? It's a very difficult question uh, to answer. It's, it's an easy question to dismiss. Uh, there are those who think that higher education uh, doesn't need to define its value. Its value is, is self-evident. Uh, self um, it's an old question. Um, there's a, um, a 19th century uh, saint, uh, John Henry Cardinal Newman, the founder of University College Dublin, who once he stepped down as president and founder of the university, spent the rest of his life writing a treatise called The Value of a University. And at some point during this, during this uh, process of writing the treatise, Newman realizes that it doesn't matter whether education defines its own value because there are lots of things in the world with value. In fact, there are many, th many more things to teach in a university than you can possibly teach. So you're stuck with make making choices. And as soon as you make a choice, you're in the realm of economics because you have to have some way of making that choice. And that means that you have to have, at least in your head, an idea of what the value of the education is, or you can't make the, make the choice. So this is, this is a question that's been with Western education for a very long time. Well, I'm, I'm all about getting people to talk about higher education. Um, there's a lot of discussion in the book uh, about parting the curtain, giving, um, giving folks outside academia a glimpse about what goes on uh, inside, uh, inside academic institutions. Um, a lot of discussion in the book about, uh, about demanding improvement but avoiding, uh, avoiding quick, uh, quick fixes. Um, I'm a technologist, so some people have looked at my book and say, well, this is just a technologist rant. Um, there's actually very little technology uh, in, the, in, the, um, in the book. And in fact, the examples that I choose 
of, of improvement are not technological examples uh, at all. They're all examples of fundamental, uh, fundamental change. But more than anything else, I'm concerned about stimulating informed discussion um, about higher education. And, and this idea of informed discussion, I think, is something that really we need to talk about for, for a few minutes here, because there's a lot of uninformed discussion about what's happening in higher education. There's, there's a discussion which says, you know, we're just producing too many college graduates. Not as many people go to college as should, we, we're sending too many people to college. We, we, we should be sending people to other things than, than college. And, and by the way, those students that are coming out of our universities are getting low paid, unskilled jobs um, that uh, someone with a high school degree or less would be equally qualified for. It's an unchallenged assumption. Until Anthony Carnival uh, at Georgetown University actually did a horizontal study, macroeconomic study, of the dollar value of a college degree. And it turns out that um, we've been underproducing as a nation college graduates for the last 40 years. What do I mean by underproducing? If you look at the demand for college graduates versus degrees coming out of our universities, we have been underproducing by about a half percent a year for a long time. And if you add that number up, we are short about 20 million college graduates just to supply the workforce needs in the United States. And, and it turns out that if you just take the Department of Labor rankings of skill levels, college graduates do not go into unskilled positions. The number of college graduates that go into low-skilled jobs is under 5%. And if, by chance, you have a degree from Cornell and you want to flip burgers for a living, you're much better off than the guy next to you who only has a high school degree. You will earn more of your lifetime than that non-college degree um, burger flipper. So there's, there's, a, there's a, uh, just a wealth of information in the Georgetown study that's available to anyone who wants to look about um, the value of a college, um, a college degree. I mentioned tuition costs a few minutes ago. Well, tuition is going up a lot. Uh, in fact, if you look at all of the, all the, the, the increases um, that are tracked, um, public universities, private universities, uh, over the last, um, what, 15 years now, it's going up uh, at about four times the consumer price index. That's twice healthcare costs. It's, it's a dramatic, it's a dramatic, uh, dramatic increase. There are a lot of reasons for that, almost none of which have to do with massive cost increases in the university. So for example, for example, one of the things that's driving tuition increases, uh, particularly in public universities, is what I call mission creep. Mission creep is what it sounds like. Universities are doing a lot of things uh, and, and those things aren't always related to what happens uh, in, the, um, in the classroom. Sponsored research, intercollegiate athletics, technology licensing, performing arts centers, hotels and convention bureaus, all of these things are good and worthy projects that universities undertake. Uh, and at a time when public support for universities is growing, there's even a way to fund this stuff. But we all know what's been happening in public universities. State support has been declining by a lot. What hasn't happened is that those extra missions haven't been discarded. They've been funded from the only source of flexible funds that's available in the university. The money that shows up in the classroom. Money associated with education. How is that funded? It's funded by jacking up tuitions on, um, uh, on students. So I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about this, but let me just mention two areas where there's, there's a lot of misinformation. Um, sponsored research, for example. Universities that want to creep up into the ranks of, of great research institutions will take a look at the amount of money flowing into an MIT or a University of Michigan and say, I want some of that, and they'll mount uh, they'll mount uh, a research program to, to go after it. The fact of the matter is that for the vast majority of institutions, 
it costs you two and a half dollars to bring in every dollar of sponsored research. So you better have it in your mission to be a research university because there's no other way to fund it. Intercollegiate athletics. Presidents will tell you it's a front door to the university. Uh, uh, it, it, it contributes to the coffers. It brings students to my, um, to my front, front door. 60% uh, of the bowl eligible football schools lose money on their intercollegiate athletics programs. The median loss, the median loss in BCS schools is $10 million. It goes up to 30, almost $40 million for some, for some institutions. And where does that money come from? If you're lucky, it comes out of a separate foundation, but most of the time, it comes out of the classroom. So there are a lot of worthy things that a university can do, um, but when there's no money to do it, you look to the only pot of money that's unclaimed, and it's education. So some controversy in the book, as you might have guessed. Um, um, already I talk a lot about the difference between a faculty-centered university and a student-centered um, uh, university. That's drawn some interest from my, um, from my colleagues. Um, I do talk about the role of presidents a lot in the, uh, in the book, and I thought I would be getting a lot of pushback from my own president and, and others, but in, in point of fact, that hasn't happened. Um, presidents are in a very interesting position uh, in this whole discussion because presidents are by and large recruited to lead institutions um, on the basis of their ability to steward donors, students, alumni, funds. The notion of stewardship crops up a lot uh, among university, um, university leaders and of course they're incented for for performing well uh, in, that, um, in that realm. There's a big disconnect between how the public views universities and how presidents of those universities view their own performance. There was a, a study by the Pew Foundation um, May of last year, May of 2011, that compared public attitudes to higher education with presidential, presidents of universities, uh, assessments of how well they were doing. The public, by a large majority did not think that colleges and universities were doing a good job of providing value for the tuition dollar. Presidents, by a 76% majority, thought that they were doing a good or excellent job. It's a disconnect. I just gave you the statistics for BCS uh, schools uh, losing, um, uh, losing, losing money. Um, the majority of presidents of those schools thought that their programs were doing fine. How do you win? How do you win if you're, if you're, if you're a president? Now we know there's a new study coming out from the Pew Foundation that says that presidents that, that are, uh, are forward thinking and are using online education to reduce the costs uh, and improve the quality of delivery to, to, to undergraduates uh, have overshot that mark too. Um, uh, the majority of the presidents that have experience with, with online education think that the quality of the online experience, or at least the blended online experience, uh, is better than strictly classroom. The public, by a 20% margin, thinks not. So if you're a president, you're, in a, tough, you're in, a, in a tough situation. But the role of presidents is very, very critical to making any permanent, um, permanent change. Let me, let me try, to, try to place this discussion um, in, um, in some context. You, and to do this, I'm going to make a definition for you. And it's a definition that I make a lot in the book and use, um, and use throughout the, the, the book. It's the definition of the middle. Uh, it surprises a lot of people outside academia, but it's true that higher education is a class system. There are a few institutions, a hundred or so institutions at the top of the heap, the elite institutions, Ivy League institutions, the great public research uh, universities. At the other extreme, there are just an incredible number of new experiments in higher education. University of Phoenix, 27,000 new universities uh, in, in India, the, the, the Khan Academy, those places are doing just fine. They're, they have their own track. The elites are, 
uh, sitting on multi-billion dollar endowments. They're doing just fine. In the middle are somewhere between two and 3,000 universities that are not doing fine. They are trying to emulate the institutions above them. If you're a public university, the surest shot of getting to the next rung is to try to imitate the University of Michigan. If you're a private university, a small one, the surest shot is to emulate Williams College. Or if you're a bigger one, to emulate one of the Ivy, uh, Ivy, Ivy Leagues. Um, it's a culture that drives an unproductive, um, unproductive behavior. And what I want to do is read the effects of that from a chapter in the book entitled, Beware the Well Oiled, Oiled Machine. Linda's first challenge when she was named department head was to reform the curriculum. Students were required to take the introductory courses in her department that were appropriate for their majors. This requirement meant that, meant that the instructional workload for the introductory teachers amounted to thousands of credit hours per year, many more contact hours than would be consistent with effective mentoring. Over time, the department had figured out how to cope with such a high workload. They decided to become a sort of factory. Part-time instructors, usually retired professionals, were handed an hour-by-hour -hour lesson plan and a large stack of overhead transparencies. Projects were carried out in smaller groups under the supervision of teaching assistants, many of them undergraduates themselves. Tenure-track faculty members had virtually no contact with undergraduates, and there was no faculty supervision in the introductory course sequence. A student services organization staffed by non-faculty academic professionals and advisors oversaw the entire operation, which consumed a sizable portion of the department's operating budget. By 2002, the results were indisputable. A cheating scandal had exposed to, exposed to the glare of national media. Um, lab assignments and projects designed as a rite of passage by upperclassmen and graduate students required an unreasonable amount of time to complete and were wildly out of sync with the academic goals of most students. Student complaints far exceeded any other unit on campus, and the attrition rate in Linda's department was well above 50 percent. Even worse, the introductory courses alienated female students. Male teaching assistants assigned project tasks by gender. Women were assigned writing and documentation tasks. Men were assigned leadership roles. Female enrollment was a full 10% below the national average and 20 points below the um, other departments in the university. Open-ended comments from students confirmed that there were few mature guiding hands in the introductory courses. Linda's step was to hire Mark, a respected senior professor who had a reputation as a sort of turnaround expert to guide the reorganization of student services. Mark began to review operations of the student services organization, but longtime staffers immediately warned him that he should not mess around with how things were currently being done. Why? Because it's a well-oiled machine. It was a revelation. Even the support staff thought of themselves as workers on a factory floor, and the learning spaces reflected it. Students hung out on long wooden benches, in a large lobby with a shabby green carpet, and to get to the instructor's offices, students had to pass under a hand-lettered sign that said swamp. This was a remarkably effective setup for the students who chose to remain, but students on campus and off were choosing other paths in increasingly large numbers. Student services staff members received consistently high marks from their supervisors during annual performance reviews, and it didn't take Mark long to figure out why the supervisors loved the well-oiled machine. The cost of instruction per introductory course was low. Advisors effectively moved the few students who chose to remain uh, through the program without a lot of hassle. Accreditation teams routinely approved the curriculum without requiring much from the department. And best of all, the tenured faculty members were rarely bothered by undergraduates. While students, alumni, and an alarmed public were letting Mark know that the well-oiled machine was not doing its job, the department's research reputation continued to rise, it became a top 10 department. In the strange accounting of the middle, things were going well. So that is, in a nutshell, what happens in the middle. The question is, what do you do, what do, you do about it? So what's going on? 
Um, this is a multi-sided problem. There's no simple, simple, simple answer to what's, uh, to what's going on. In some sense, it's an economic bubble. Uh, in some sense, it's the result of entitlement uh, and lack of oversight. To some sense, it's the result of a culture that overly values chasing the guy above you to the exclusion of your own, um, of your own value. Um, the American higher education system became great because of experimentation. The colonial schools were pale limitations of Oxford and Cambridge, and it was after the Civil War that there was an explosion. Thousands of new universities were invented. Some of them were sectarian schools that lasted only a couple of years. Some of them uh, were, were crazy institutions that had no right to exist. But some of them were Williams College and Johns Hopkins and Tufts and Mills College uh, and, and, and the, great, the great institutions. Um, we stopped experimenting in this country about 1960. There has been no basic increased capacity in higher education in, in the United States since 1960. We've only had one new research university this century, UC Merced, the only new research university, and it's under budgetary pressure from Berkeley and UCLA uh, that may or may not cause it to also wink out of um, existence. So what is the path forward? There is no path forward that doesn't require deep thought about how to change your, your institution. Any institution that is not fundamentally concerned about defining its value proposition is probably going to have trouble over the next 25 years. You can find lists of universities every week that have closed. I was just on a conference call yesterday, day before yesterday, uh, with, with um, a, a trustee from the University of Michigan who's overseeing the closure of a Michigan university. And I have discussions like that multiple times a week. The University of Georgia system closed four institutions. Well, they merged institutions, but the result, end result is that four institutions will close as a result. So what do you do? There's no formula. But there are signposts. There are rules of the road that anyone who's thinking about the future of higher education should follow. And let, let, me, let me just kind of break them into, into, two, into two categories. One concerns this topic that I've been talking about for the last few minutes, defining your value. What is defining your value? Um, it means forgetting about who, who's above you. Uh, it's worrying about what differentiates you. Uh, I speak to a lot of uh, leadership groups for uh, for college and university presidents, and one of the one of the exercises that we do is to is to print out literally print out the strategic plan from the university, and then I will bring in another strategic plan from another university and ask the deans and provosts to compare them. Can you tell which is which? Embarrassingly enough, it's very difficult to tell the plans of one university from another. That's not differentiation. That's a herd mentality. You are trying to copy the guys above you. Establishing your brand uh, and being open. So once you know what your value is, what do you do? Then you have to go about the difficult business of architecting an institution that delivers that value. And that may mean if you are not a research institution, never becoming a research institution. That may mean forgetting about that fancy technology licensing office that is always going to cost more than any license revenue from any patent that you, that you produce. That may mean buying into a consortium of online delivery uh, and reducing your general ed offerings by 15%, 20%, 50%. It may mean using technology. It may mean that those presidents who think that there's value in online courses have to be much clearer in their public explanation of what the quality is that's actually going to be delivered through those, through those courses. In short, focusing on your own measures of success. And then finally, and this is um, important, we're in a public institution here, it's, it's important, especially for public institutions, to focus on who you are and where you are. There's, there's an idea called the Wisconsin idea that not many university presidents have heard about. John Bascom 
19th century president at the University of Wisconsin. In, in his student valedictory, told the graduating class of 1879, it's the job of a public university to open its gates to the people who pay the bills. That became known as the Wisconsin idea. And it's been lost over the last 50 years, frankly, in this country. You can go to, you can go to universities that exist in the most awful, horrible neighborhoods and ask what role has the university played in bringing up the quality of life for the neighbors of that university. The president of the University of Syracuse is under constant pressure for doing this because it's not related to the stewardship mission of the, of the university. So, so those, are, those are the items that, that anyone who's looking for an agenda for what is the future of higher education needs to look at. It's not adopting the coolest technology. It's not going to online courses. Uh, it's not, it's not uh, bringing in the latest learning management system. It's looking at your value and figuring out how you're going to, to deliver it. And there are relatively few institutions that have been bold enough to, to do that. We're running out of time, but I do have one more, one more story that I, I won't read to you. I'll just, I'll just relay to you. At the end of the book, in a chapter called The Banner Year, I talk about the year 1852, um, which was a year of phenomenal invention in liberal arts education. Tufts University was founded that year. Williams and Amherst had just split. Amherst had moved to a different part of the, uh, uh, of the state. Mills College was, was founded. Um, a lot of, the, a lot of the, the Protestant universities that dot the Midwest were founded um, that year. And Antioch College was founded that year. Horace Mann was the first president of Antioch College. Horace Mann, the author of progressive thought in education in this country, founded Antioch College. And Antioch, over the next hundred years, became a beacon of progressive thought. It was, it was, it was such, such an iconic place that, that when I, in 1969, I was driving across the country and made a detour to, um, to Yellow Springs to visit Antioch College just because, you know, I was a recent graduate. I wanted to absorb what I later found out would be the last of the counterculture, but, but it, was, it was a place that, that, uh, um, that had seen the growth in African-American students. Coretta Scott King and her sister were both, both uh, alumni. It was, it, was, it was a place that we all thought of as um, a place that we would aspire to be. As I was writing the book, I opened the New York Times and saw an editorial. It was masquerading as an obituary, but it was really an editorial. Antioch College, where the arts were too liberal. It had died. Antioch College shut its doors. They were down to 500 students. Um, the AAU came in and did an audit, uh, found great problem with the way that the university was being, was being governed. What they were silent on was the value proposition that Antioch gave to its students. The faculty had put forth a strategic plan uh, the year before uh, that drove students away from Antioch College in large numbers. Students didn't come, donors uh, didn't, didn't come, and um, they shut down. It's a metaphor for what happens when a university loses its way. And I won't give away the, uh, the, uh, the ending of the, of the book, but I was relaying this story to a colleague at a big Midwestern university, and I, I invite you to read the epilogue of the, of the book because it really stands as, as the challenge for, uh, for institutions in the middle uh, who want to escape the fate uh, of Antioch College. So I thank you for your attention. We've uh, got some time for questions, so uh, it's a good opportunity. If, uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand, and, uh, and we'll get the microphone to you. Yes, sir, right here. The microphone will come right at you. Is it on? Hello? Yeah. Yes. Okay. What kind of questions uh, should a parent of a child soon to be going to college 
be asking in view of some of the yeah. kind of new concerns that you've raised in terms of looking at a college, deciding if it's the right one, is it doing the right things in view of today's environment? Well, you know, I, we, get, we back, get back to the issue of, of economics here. Um, families are going to be investing fifty, seventy-five, hundred thousand dollars, sometimes two hundred thousand dollars, in undergraduate education, and and the, the question is, is that cost at all related to what's going to come out of that four-year um, that four-year program? So, so what what I um, what I tell parents, uh, you know, our daughter did the college tour several years ago, and, and it's what what we did, um, is um, don't fall prey to the marketing. Uh, uh, teams that take you around the campus, you know, there, there are, is Spencer still here? Um, <laughs> I'll get in trouble with Spencer. There, there, there are, uh, are, are always well-groomed uh, hordes of, of, of fraternity members and sorority members that will guide students through the pretty buildings on campus and show where the rock climbing um, wall is. Uh, I would encourage parents, if I could offer just one piece of advice to, to um, parents of prospective students, break away from the group. Um, randomly select a faculty office and knock on the door uh, and keep doing that until you find someone that says come in um, <laughs> and start asking questions uh, this is the high point when you're when you're being recruited to a college this is the high point of the relationship it never gets any better than this so if they won't talk to you then what do you think it's going to be like three years three years from now and once you've done that Find some other students. Go to the go to the student union. Go to the bookstore. Call her a student. Um, if you're uh, if you're shy about doing it, or your 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 son or daughter is going to get embarrassed by it, uh, send your spouse. Uh, but but someone needs to talk to talk to real students and say, so tell me what life is like here. What is what is an education um, like at this um, at this university? If you don't like what you hear, uh, run the other way. No matter what the ranking is, no matter what, uh, what people tell you the value of that un university is. Uh, and, then, and then all of the other diligence that you would do uh, in making any other investment of, of that kind follows suit. But at the first moment that you step, step foot on campus, uh, you should be thinking about finding out as much as you can what, what's, what's really going on at that institution. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Here comes the microphone right there. I was fascinated with your comment regarding the need to remember that it is the public that pays the bills, that keeps our higher, higher ed institutions open. My question is, what would be your recommendations to help academe refuse to isolate itself, whether intentionally or unintentionally, from that very same public? Because I think that is what drives the development of this chasm between the two entities. Right, so honest dialogue, I think, is, is exactly the right way to, uh, to look at that. And, and discussions like this simply don't happen often enough. Um, you know, this book is selling extraordinarily well. Um, it's bought by a two-thirds margin by my colleagues. It's great, I'm glad they're, I'm glad they're, 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 they're reading it. But you know what? Um, everyone who reads Thomas Friedman's um, the world is flat, needs to read a book like this because he doesn't explain the value of a university in a world that's been flattened by technology and, and economics. Um, every cable news show that shows someone with an easy answer uh, to fixing higher education needs to have a book like this uh, uh, under his or her arm to say, well, you know what? I'm going to win some of these bar bets because what you're saying about higher ed simply isn't um, simply isn't isn't true, and and you know, I will come back to to um, my favorite target here, uh, which is university presidents, um, and and to a large extent they would agree with this. Uh, they need to do a much much better job at connecting what's going on in the university with the public uh, the public investment, uh, and and. We all need to put pressure on legislators uh, and, uh, and, and political leaders uh, to stop demagoguing higher education uh, and, and, and restore funds to a level where, um, uh, where universities can, can operate. It, it is literally heartbreaking uh, to walk through chemistry labs at the University of California at Berkeley where Nobel Prize winners work and see trash cans overflowing with waste, floors that haven't been swept, 
uh, in months and glassware on the floor that's, um, that, that's broken. At the same time, at the same time, that universities in Asia are funneling incredible money uh, into their, um, into their, their colleges and, and universities. So it's not an e easy case to make. And if, if we in academia had been spectacularly successful at arguing for the value of our institutions, we wouldn't be having this discussion here tonight, but we, we, we haven't. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, let's go right at the back, Bob. Let's go back at the back. Yeah. Um, good, good points. Very excellent work. Our, as you know, our nation is facing totally unsustainable debt, and the people we elect, by and large, are college educated. Is that a failure of higher education? <laughs> um, so a lot of them have college degrees. Um, we don't know if they're actually educated. Um, um, there's a, we can have this discussion off, off, uh, offline. I, I, I think, I think it, it comes back to a combination of things. What, one is uh, there, are, there are easy targets in, um, in, um, in government, uh, and, and one, easy, one easy target is, is um, uh, the, um, um, the aristocracy, the meritocracy, the elite that, that are, are purportedly populating universities. It, 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 it's much easier to, to, to attack, you know, what Spear Wagner used to call pointy-headed intellectuals than it is, um, is defense budgets. Um, it's, it's also the case that, that we in universities have been, have been just unmindful of how we look to the rest of the world. Um, I'll just I'll, I'll give you I'll give you one example that I, I, I blogged about a, a few few weeks ago. The faculty lunch. Who in this room feels entitled to a free lunch? You can go to any university campus and find that the price of getting someone to attend a faculty meeting is a free lunch. <laughs> How am I going to get my faculty to discuss? new curriculum changes. Well, we'll buy them lunch. Now, what sense does that make? It may be true. It may be a good thing. Maybe, maybe you know, our insurance companies and banks should be, should be serving gratis lunches for their, for, their, for their employees. But at a time when we're cutting staff, raising, raising tuitions, the optics of the free lunch at the university has really kind of taken over as a meme in, in, um, in some parts of of society, and, and, and we've projected an image of not caring about what we do with the money, of not being good stewards of the, of the money. It's made it easy to, to go after, um, to go after the, the, the cuts. Um, the, um, and and one, uh, one, one more comment, and then, then I'll, I'll, I'll turn to another, another question. Um, the amount of misinformation uh, among legislators, federal, state legislators, about what happens inside a university is just horrendously large. Um, I, I, do, I do a congressional tour uh, every year. I, I go through the Georgia delegation, talk about what's going on, meet with, with committees, talk about what's happening in, um, in research. Uh, and, and the last time, after 2010 elections, uh, the, the le legislative liaison pulled me aside and said, look, you cannot use the word basic research. Well, that's what we do, it's basic research. You can't use the word basic research with these congressmen. Why is that, I asked. Um, and, and what I was told was, was that the committees get beat up for basic research because the congressmen said, well, why are we doing basic research? We should be doing advanced research. <laughs> so if that's the, if that's the level of the, of the, of the discussion, then, then you have to go a long ways beyond that in order to have any substantive, substantive change. All right, we're good. Okay, uh, Gordon Apple. Um, first, I want to say that uh, Donald Bobbitt said he would like to have been here tonight. He's uh, out of town, gives his apologies. He was familiar with what you were doing. Great. Um, my question has to do with the cost relationship with the number of students. Would you agree that at best there's a, line, a linear 
relationship here between a number of students and the, and the overall cost, where there's pressure to increase the number of students while the resources are decreasing. And so, don't you think we need to find a better way to use technology and such to reach more students at lo much lower cost to solve this problem? It, it, yeah, in, indeed. And in, in one, one of the, I mentioned experimentation, one of the great experiments that's being conducted right now, mainly in Silicon Valley, although not exclusively, uh, is, is, is using master teachers and technology to reach hundreds of thousands of students uh, in a, in a single, single course. Now, why would you want to do that? Uh, well, there are many reasons for having a master teacher reach a lot of students. Those of us who are you know, kind of science and technology guys grew up in the, uh, in the 60s and 70s watching Mr. Wizard on, on, on TV who taught us a lot about, uh, about science and, and Leonard Bernstein taught us a lot about, uh, about, um, about music. So there's a value in having a master teacher who can, who can project through the, through the medium. But there's also, there's also a growing body of learning theory that says that what happens in the classroom is really it's costly for one thing. You have to heat the classroom and, and, and you know, pay off the building and, and all of that stuff. Uh, it, it's not the most effective way to reach students. Uh, st students, to a large extent, pay attention. If they come to class at all, pay attention for 15, 20 minutes of a 15-minute class. Um, and, um, and you're there for that whole, um, that, that whole time. Why not change what you teach and how you teach it so that what happens in the lecture hall really gets, that's like homework. You, know, you, can, you, can, you can read the book, you can also watch, watch, watch the lecture. What we're going to do in class, what we're going to do in the classroom is mentoring, one-on-one, one-on-one -on -one mentoring. There's, there's, there's a famous study that is widely ignored um, on, uh, on the effectiveness of, of varying, varying teaching, uh, teaching styles. Uh, it's a 1984 study. It's a meta study, actually. The authors looked out across all the literature and classified teaching styles into, into cl normal classroom, which you give a lecture, give a test, you either pass or fail, what they call classroom mastery. You give a lecture, you keep repeating the tests until students do well at the test, and um, uh, tutoring, one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one tutoring. Uh, and across all ranges of students, across all subjects, um, master classroom teaching is marginally better than ordinary classroom teaching. These are all bell-shaped curves. It kind of moves, moves to, the, to the right. One-on-one -on -one tutoring moves everyone, moves everyone to the 98th percentile. Doesn't matter who they are, doesn't matter what they're teaching, doesn't matter what, they're, what, what, they're, what their background is. So if you want a challenge for technology, there is a challenge for technology. Figure out a way of delivering the tutoring experience to that billion new students that are coming into, into higher education. Ladies and gentlemen, let's, uh, let's thank Professor DeMillo. I didn't know who Abelard was either, but I'm glad to know it, and I hope you will join me in purchasing this book as he signs it now. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.